So, hi uh, everybody and good afternoon or morning and welcome to today's uh, Tech Tuesday. My name is Anna Bruders. I work at Lean Shopping Science Park as a community and employer branding manager and I'm really happy when we can gather people to share knowledge with each other. And the perfect occasion for that is these kind of events called Tech Tuesday. And usually we are familiar with the companies helping us there or, or presenting. Um, there are five of the bigger companies in Lean Shopping Science Park, Sectra, CKVP, Ericsson, Nira Dynamics and Combitech, who together create these Tech Tuesdays. But today we have like a special edition with a company called Grapit, and we're really happy to have them. It's really, uh, it's, a, it's an exciting topic to talk about, I think, but also I really like because we have, it's a company that is both in Lulio and here in Lean Shopping. So to also show uh, the, uh, yeah, show companies from around uh, Sweden uh, and what they are doing. Um, as you maybe have noticed, we record this uh, event. I hope that's fine with everybody and we'll put it up at our uh, play channel at leancoppingsciencepark.se. Um, and uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat, but there will also be some time for a Q&A in the end. I really look forward to this because we both get a presentation, but we also will get a live demo uh, from Grapit. So I will hand over the word and the floor, the digital floor to Per Lindgren at Grapit. Well, you are muted right now. I will. So. So now we can hear so. you. Welcome. Thank you. Oops. So I'm Per Lingenen. I'm a PhD and professor at Lule University of Technology. Hello. Uh, what is? What? Uh, sorry, um, I need to do my screen sharing. Uh, I thought that it was shared already. So now, now you should be able to see my screen. Right, thank you. Uh, so I work at the uh, University of Technology as a professor and a PhD in, in embedded systems. Uh, also, I work for uh, Grepit AB as the director of R&D and the expert consultant. And in the presentation, we will also meet Andreas Lundqvist, and he's the COO of Grepit. And we work in embedded systems. And uh, the, talk, uh, the topic of the talk is how to integrate Rust and, and uh, Arctic uh, scheduler in embedded projects. Let's see if we can switch like that. So there is a, a challenge regarding IoT um, in that the amount of devices uh, is going to increase over time. And we see that uh, it's quite a rapid increase over the upcoming years. And how do we manage development of all these embedded devices that are interconnected and on a uh, longer term, uh, it's expected that we will have a trillion uh, devices over the next 20 years or something like that. And, and it's a huge investment um, that goes in both software and hardware development. And this source or this graph is from ARM. So there will be a lot of investment in this area. And um, they project that most of the, of the effort is going to be related to IoT services. And the first thing that they, they, uh, they mention is the systems design and integration. And, and that is amounting to a total of 45% of these huge investments. And we see also that uh, the hardware component cost is minor in comparison to the software investments. So it makes sense to have a close look at software development. And uh, regarding design, 
Uh, of course, all these embedded devices need to be robust and reliable, but also security comes into play. Uh, even more now when things are becoming more interconnected. So the attack surfaces will naturally increase. Um, we also have, have uh, efficiency requirements like on the CPU, memory, power, bandwidth, and so forth. And also a cost issue, both for the design and the maintenance of all these systems. So it's, it's really challenging. And uh, what we are going to, to propose uh, is, is to use the Rust language, uh, which brings performance, reliability, and productivity, and, and combine that with the Arctic model for computation and scheduling. So it's very efficient, and it provides safe concurrency, and it's easy to program. And it's an ideal match for IoT devices, robotics, automotive, et cetera. So I mentioned already the Rust language, um, performance on par or better than C, C++, zero cost abstractions. That means that, that both code and memory overhead is optimized out at compile time. So you can still use high level programming abstractions, but it does not cost at runtime. Uh, reliability is improved by memory safety which is compile time checking and built-in assertions done by the, the compiler and uh, also by the runtime code in case the assertions is inserted by the compiler. And it has well-defined behavior in all cases, uh, unlike C and C++, where you might run into undefined behavior. Uh, productivity. Um, best in class ecosystem with version handling built in. So it ships with, uh, with a lot of tooling already. And it has been voted the most loud language among developers on Stack Overflow since the release of the language in 2015. So, what is memory safety? Well, uh, the Rust memory safety builds on linear type theory. I um, won't go into to, uh, detail with this. But uh, the key is that each variable has a single owner and you may access it by reference under some restrictions. And these are called the Rust aliasing rules. So you may have multiple uh, immutable references may coexist, but only a single unique mutable reference is allowed at any time. And this is statically checked uh, by the compiler uh, and uh, the, the checking procedure is called the borrow checker and it enforces the aliasing rules. So uh, in, in effect, that ensures all references to be live and point to valid data. So it's a bit similar to uh, C++ with the RAAII, but fully enforced at compile time. So in effect, Rust programs passing compilation, they are memory safe. Uh, unless code explicitly marked as unsafe, because for unsafe code, you have to, to take responsibility yourself for the soundness or safety of the code. But most Rust invariant still uh, uh, applies. Uh, the only thing that differs uh, unsafe code from safe code is that you may do raw pointer dereferencing and calling other unsafe code. Besides that, it's exactly the same rules for aliasing and whatnot as you're used to when programming in Rust. So what is not covered? Uh, well, out of memory, you may allocate uh, memory in Rust, uh, but the allocator, the default allocator um, may run into a panic in case that, that um, your memory is depleted. So in Rust terms, this is still sound because panicking, aborting a program uh, doesn't break memory safety, but it breaks reliability. So it's up to the user and, and the operating system to deal with it, what is going to happen when a panic occurs. And it might be very hard or even impossible uh, to recover from a panic. So it's a no-go for safety critical applications, uh, like in automotive and such, uh, where you cannot really uh, afford 
uh, a situation where the system holds. Another thing that is also not covered by Rust uh, is stack memory overruns. So it's not the concept of the Rust language. Uh, runtime system, for example, if you're running Rust under Linux, uh, the operating system may protect stack frames and catch overruns. Uh, so by, by that, uh, what is going to happen is essentially that you get the panic, uh, which does not break soundness, but it breaks reliability. So similar to this out of memory, it's hard to recover. So in essence, uh, Rust is memory safe by construction, but we have the auto memory and stack memory overruns uh, that sacrifice reliability in favor for safety. So it's not perfect, but it's far better than what we are used to for embedded programming or systems level programming in C or C++. And then uh, when we are dealing with embedded, um, we might want to have concurrency. And the standard way of doing that is by using threads, some sort of thread abstraction. And, and uh, uh, like this cat, uh, that it might look cute, but it's, uh, it's very problematic. It's deceivingly simple, uh, but it's super easy to make mistakes. If you forget to, to lock, uh, you end up in a race condition. If you forget to unlock, you might have live or dead locks. And cyclic resources dependencies uh, may lead to, to dead locks. And the complexity of, of many of these uh, threaded APIs or thread APIs, like the, the, the one provided by pthreads on the Linux, is really complicated. And what does does it mean to lock a, a, a mutex? Well, it depends on the operating system, the scheduling policy and so forth. So how the mutex was created. So in the end, uh, who knows what, what the cat brought in. It's really hard to analyze uh, threaded code. So the Arctic model is a thread-free solution. <clears throat> Instead, we have shared resources and concurrent tasks operating on these shared resources. Each, each task has run-to-end semantics, and resources can be locked only in a last-in, first-out order. So it's like nested critical sections. <clears throat> and to the right, we see an example where we have some resource, uh, in this case named shared. Uh, we have a task. Uh, which uh, uses this uh, shared resource. So we indicate here that uh, it's, uh, it, it will use the shared resource. And through a context, uh, this CX here, we get access to a proxy for this resource, which can be locked. And inside the, the lock here or critical section for this resource, we might access it as a mutable variable in Rust or a reference to a mutable variable. So this is the whole thing. Uh, from a programmer's perspective, it's quite easy to, to uh, deal with concurrency. The tasks are concurrent by default in, in Rust and maybe, uh, or in Arctic and maybe associated with a, a priority. So, Resources, when we access them, they are accessed through named critical sections where the name is actually the resource name. Um, so it restricts concurrency to ensure unique ownership. So actually, once you're inside this critical section, you are the only uh, owner of, of this resource. So ownership is passed around by the Arctic scheduler. Tasks, they are sequences of operations with run to completion semantics, as I mentioned, and they are only uh, allowed to claim resources in this nested fashion. And uh, this adheres to the stack uh, resource policy. So basically our execution model and the stack resource policy model is the same. And uh, this stack behavior is what, what makes SRP and Arctic unique. And we get a lot from that. 
uh, we get preemptive uh, scheduling. We can choose what policy we want, if we want the earliest deadline first or uh, uh, priority monotonic scheduling. Um, we get raise and deadlock free execution uh, by default, and we have bounded priority inversion. So the blocking is only by a single longest critical section for any resource with a ceiling higher than the priority of T of the task T. And it's very memory efficient since it executes on a single shared stack. And uh, there is a lot of theory for computing response time, schedulability, total stack analysis and so forth uh, already done for this stack resource policy theory. So that is great that we have a solid foundation for our scheduler and it's really easy to analyze a system that is uh, designed under SRP or for SRP based scheduling. But it requires a static analysis of the task and resource set to ensure this lethal ordering and compute the ceilings for each resource. And the static priority ceiling for a resource is computed as the maximum priority for any task that may access this resource. So can we translate the thread model to SRP? Well, that is problematic because threads can typically be created and destroyed on the fly. And there is a lot of synchronization primitives like mutexes, semaphores, conditional variables, and so forth that needs to be translated. And there is no easy, straightforward way of, of doing this. So without the model of the program, it's not easy or even possible to to translate threaded programs into SRP-based programs. So in practice, we see SRP is not that common, even though that it's very advantageous to embedded. Um, there is an OSEC slot kernel, uh, part of this uh, AutoSAR standard, but uh, it's very limited uh, in use and, and uh, we don't see SRP being applied in in practice, in general purpose programming, it's very rare. So Cortex M Arctic is an implementation of this single core scheduler for the Cortex M family of MCU. So we cover already a lot of, of different hardware uh, since it's just the ARM core that we are dependent on, not the peripherals. So there are strong guarantees to race free execution, which we get from SRP. It's unbreakable, ensured by design uh, that resources are accessible only when claimed because we never deal out resources. We just deal out uh, proxies to resources. And we get this deadlock free execution as a property of SRP. So it integrates well with the uh, Cortex-M uh, ecosystem in Rust. Um, and uh, we can use SVD to Rust generated peripheral access. For those of you who have programmed embedded on Rust, uh, you may be uh, you may be, me, be aware of this SVD to Rust, which generates sort of a low level API to your peripherals. Um, and there are embedded hand crates that implements and support different hardware. And uh, all this integrates well with Arctic. And the cargo build system that ships with uh, Rust is directly applicable as well. So it's quite easy and straightforward to use uh, Cortex-M Arctic. It's very CPU and memory efficient and it has predictable overhead. And uh, we are using the, the interrupts directly to, to schedule the task. So there is no software involved in, uh, in um, dispatching a hardware task or an interrupt driven task. And entering and exiting critical sections is just a few machine instructions, like two instructions. Um, uh, we also provide message passing and so forth as an extension to this basic uh, uh, resource and task model. And these are implemented in Rust and uh, 
based on these zero cost abstractions, we get very efficient queue handling for message passing and so forth. And as I mentioned, the SRP properties gives a bounded priority inversion and single stack execution and gives us methods for doing real time analysis like response time analysis and so forth. So under the hood, in order to, to uh, derive these tasks and, and uh, or analyze the task and resources, uh, we use a procedure macro, which is a sort of a language extension possibility in Rust. And it computes the uh, resource ceiling values and generates the glue code for scheduling and resource management. So it sets up your interrupt controller and and uh, do the heavy heavy lifting of embedded programming of the low level part of that, so you can focus on the application logic instead of the the scheduling details. So if you assign task priorities inverse to deadlines, we get the monotonic scheduling, which is uh, very useful to to uh, uh, resource constraint systems because we can do the the priority-based uh, scheduling directly by the hardware. Uh, locks in uh, Arctic are always wait-free. So as soon as a task is uh, allowed to start executing, it will execute to end without blocking on any resource that it claims or locks. So there is never any additional context switching involved. That makes it also super effective or efficient. And uh, uh, this lock and unlock is just a few machine instructions. And it uses uh, the base three register of the Cortex uh, family. So for Cortex M3 and above, it's just a single register access. Um, and Arctic is able to optimize out locks wherever possible. So due to the analysis, uh, it won't even uh, need to do this single operations in order to protect resources when it can, can prove that uh, there won't be any race condition occurring. For example, if two tasks are at the same priority, uh, they cannot preempt each other. So supporting tools, uh, we have Cargo Call Stack, uh, which is an LLVM based tool. Uh, that we developed um, and it do the call graph reconstruction. And uh, from there, we can do stack estimation. Uh, we also have Cargo CLI, uh, it's an experimental implementation for now, which provides symbolic execution for Rust programs and Arctic programs as well uh, to prove programs to be free of panics. So we get guaranteed defined behavior and panic-free execution. Uh, we can also use this to prove equivalence in between implementations. If you make an alteration to your code, you can prove that for any input possible, the output will remain the same. And you can also give uh, additional properties in terms of assertions uh, that will be statically verified, meaning that you don't even have to run your code on the target in order to, to validate that it operates correctly. And uh, you can use that to ensure safety, liveness, and partial correctness of programs. And uh, it's quite useful in order to uh, extend on testing by means of static analysis. And it's easy to use because it just uses assertions uh, the way that you typically write assertions in, in code. So total memory safety. Uh, we have the problem with Rust that out of memory and stack overflow is not covered by the language. So we developed Heapless as a library for dynamic memory allocation backed by static memory. Uh, so, um, it's memory safe, the implementation, and ensures panic-free operation. So in, instead of, of panicking when you run out of memory, instead you will be, just get a, a failure in terms of a return value. So it's an option value, the return value. So either you get your 
allocation or not. And it's up to you to deal with it in, instead of the kernel sort of panicking for you or the memory allocator uh, panicking for you. Uh, cargo call stack gives the worst case stack behavior per task. And uh, by that, we can also bound the total stack usage of a program on article application based on knowledge about uh, preemptions possible. And together, uh, if we combine uh, heapless together with cargo call stack, uh, then we get total memory safety. So the, the last sort of problematic part of Rust is, is mitigated by using these tools and libraries. Okay, so everything in Rust then, and everything in Arctic. Well, that might not be possible uh, in case, for example, you rely on, on uh, auto-generated code from MATLAB or some other tool, or uh, you use some black box software com component written in C, for example. Uh, or there is a lack of pre-certified software components in Rust and you don't want to develop them yourself. Or simply it's too high effort to, to use uh, or to develop your code uh, from, from ground up and you want to reuse existing C code libraries. Well, luckily uh, Rust provides excellent foreign function interface support, so FFI support. So it builds, uh, the build system integration is excellent. You can even have it building your C code for you. It's zero cost. There is no added overhead of calling into external code like C, C++ code. And if you are careful with the design, uh, the safety, the memory safety of your application remains. And regarding the, the um, uh, memory safety of the C code, by letting Rust manage the memory allocations, uh, you may actually improve memory safety of the external code base as well. So FFI is not restricted to C or C++. Any language with a compatible ADI is possible. That is that you can call into external functions. So as long as there is a compatible ADI, uh, you can do it. Uh, and tooling uh, is available to automate uh, integration of, of uh, for example, C code by Rust bindian and C bindian, and it generates the FFI bindings for you to and from C code. Um, of course, the uh, interface uh, is raw and unsafe, uh, so you have to, to vet uh, the, um, the C code for or correctness, or rely on, on somebody else uh, ensuring the correctness of the C code. Uh, Rust is based on an LLVM uh, tool chain and chips with an LLVM tool chain. So uh, we get all the benefits of LLVM also regarding uh, integration of external code. So you can do link time optimization and stuff like that. And LLVM tools typically work out the box, like the sanitizers that you are used to using. They can be applied both to uh, the C world and to the Rust world as well. So how do you go about uh, integrating um, external code? Well, if the external code is stateless, meaning that it's just like functions that you can call into, uh, then you can let Rust and Arctic to have ownership of any memory resource that you have. So the external code is just passed a reference to a locked resource for mutating the state. And you let the Arctic manage the actual resources. Uh, it's a bit more complicated if the external code is stateful then we have to wrap the whole driver or external component into an Arctic resource and let Arctic manage that. And we will see an example of how we have done that uh, for LoRa communication in a bit. Um, if the external code is stateful and self-scheduled, meaning that it captures some interrupts and, and uh, is going to be scheduled by itself on the hardware, uh, then we actually need to trust the external code 
uh, there is no way for uh, Rust or Arctic to help you there. But on the other hand, you might find these type of libraries to be pre-certified, like radio drivers and such things provided by the manufacturer. So an example of this, uh, where we have a C code driver, uh, which we have wrapped in a, a Arctic resource. Uh, we capture, for example, a radio message interrupt, uh, the reception of an uh, or arrival of a radio message uh, and trigger an Arctic task. And the Arctic task calls into the C code driver. Uh, the C code driver calls back into Rust code, which does uh, low level communication with a radio ship, for example, over SPI, as in our case. Uh, so it, this uh, Rust code talks to the hardware and get uh, some result back from the hardware uh, returns into uh, the C code driver, which eventually returns to the task, the Arctic task. And uh, using this approach, uh, we have control over the resources in Arctic, and uh, we can let the C code driver use the Rust shim code here for the low level access to the peripherals involved. So this is a quite typical use case. Uh, drivers written like this that are actually hardware agnostic. The only thing that they require is some function, some implementer of the low level communication. So Griffith has been working with Rust and Arctic uh, since the very beginning of, of the development of, of Arctic. Actually, it was called Real Time for the Masses as a research project. And then now we renamed it into Arctic once it became more popular and, and widespread. Uh, some products that Arctic uh, has been applied to is the GEMPEN. Uh, it's an analysis pen for gemstones. I sit here with you, Joachim, and he nods. <laughs> I haven't been personally involved with that project, but I think Joachim was. Uh, Nexus is another uh, project going on uh, from 2018 and on. It's a data acquisition system. Uh, it's not written in Rust, but it integrates to uh, Rust sensors for data acquisition. Uh, we're developing an X-ray GeoCore scanner, uh, which runs um, the controller, controller for it, runs uh, Rust Arctic for a company called Or Explorer. So it's not a... Uh, um, an in-house development. Uh, and then we have the uh, in-house development Spark, which is an electrical vehicle charger that we will demonstrate in a bit. Some competencies of, of uh, Griffith. Um, we work with hardware, so we do ASIC design, uh, like in this Or Explore project. Um, we also do uh, FPGA design and it's a Silings partner, so a certified Silings partner. We do PCB design assembly and so forth. We have the complete tool chain. Um, on the software side, of course, we use Rust, uh, but we also use any, any language applicable, C, C++, Python, web services and so forth. And uh, we provide expert consulting services customer development projects like this or explore project and complete system deliveries for customers. And now we're gonna have a look at uh, a Rust Arctic running the Spark uh, electrical vehicle charger and it features a Lugura radio protocol implementation in C and a radio module implemented in Rust Arctic, which integrates this C code. And uh, if you're interested in looking at some related references, uh, the slides will be put online later, and here are some links for you. And now we'll go on with a short demo. So we will move over to you walk in? Yes. Okay. I think we can 
Uh, I stop sharing here, right? So, can we? Hello there. We have access. Uh, yeah. When I have a look at the demo, so uh, this here has been uh, basically a uh, cross section of the communication stack we're using in the Spark project where we have this dev board here, more or less representing one of the charger units. And uh, if you look over there, we have a rock 7243, which is kind of a gateway, which converts from LoRa packets that will send this dev board over there. They'll send it for IP back to my laptop, which will then send it back up to our things board instance. And we'll be able to see that when we're sending a LoRa packets here with status updates, that will update over here. Now, how is this interesting in the kind of C code integration uh, idea that we're working with? Uh, and that's the that the driver that's running on this device is actually written in C, but we're calling into it from a Arctic program, which means that we're able to do safe concurrency with uh, the C code in the background. Uh, let's uh, let's have a quick look. Uh, I guess we just have a look at it working first. And uh, so we're sending, yes, we're sending a message or you are here. We're going to see that we get uh, the message sent up. This is actually the instance sending the data over to uh, things board. So we're just toggling between different error states. And if we look over here at the actual dashboard, you can see uh, the status is updating, I think. Yes, there we go. There's sometimes some collision avoidance algorithm that uh, breaks down. Okay. Um, so if we are to look, um, uh, at the actual setup of this, um, what we're doing initially is that we are setting up pins that we're going to be using. And we also set up some bindings for Slongify driver, which that you add is written by the by Helium. It's not something we had to write ourselves, but it's an open source component. We just kind of pick from the existing user space, which is quite nice. But it only really requires us to set the pins up. And then the C driver interface actually handles the rest, apart from the actual interface configuration, uh, which we don't use in Rust, which means it ends up as a well, unused resource, but this is fine because we're using it in the uh, long fire driver. So, um, more is there to say about this? Um, you were showing uh, earlier on that you can actually see the code uh, executing and that we can call into the C code. Yes, this is true. We can actually uh, enable this breakpoint I have set so. Uh, when we actually try to send our message, we see that we uh, we spark this uh, uh, this breakpoint over in the longify send function, which is the C driver. So as you can see, this is not Rust code, but actually C. Uh, so we can actually do this kind of debugging in a very nice and seamless way in Rust. We don't uh, cloud ourselves with a bunch of wrappers or anything. We just pull in the C directly, and then we get this kind of interface. So quite nice. Um, yeah, I think maybe we'll re return with some question, but as you can, uh, I think this is sufficient to prove the concept. Uh, and uh, we will now have a, a look at uh, the actual Spark system running. So you and me will walk down to the, the parking lot and meet up with Andreas. 
and I, I will go back to to my computer and take some questions if there are some Q and A in the meantime. So you can we will walk back. So I'm back here now. Welcome back. We haven't had got any questions in the chat yet, but we are not that many people in the meeting. So if you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question to Per uh, while the, um, the other one is going outside to give us a demo from the outside as well. Yeah. Um, and then we'll put the slides online later. Uh, we just uh, make some polishing and then we will uh, we'll send them to you and, and you will publish them on the site where also the talk will be, be published. Exactly. Perfect. So do we have any questions or everybody's? Talking? Everybody's eating their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, just a matter of seconds until we can have uh, a new Akim showing us the parking lot. He's running now. Yeah. <laughs> He's not sending any video. We can maybe. Yeah, now he. Okay. Yeah, I, I got into some uh, safe driving mode. <laughs> I was running too fast. <laughs> but here we have Andreas. Hi, Andreas Lundqvist is here, uh, operative chef for Greffit. Uh, some para informera er idag så handlar det väldigt mycket om hög säkerhet, tillfredslighet och produkter som vi har utvecklat bland annat där Forest Park som har para prata om. Eh, det är allting från hårdvaran, en enkel installation, kostnadseffektiv installation, så gäller det att ha rätt paketering. Eh, den här typen av paketering kan du jobba med alla typer av fordon. Eh, värma ditt fordon ifall du har motorvärmare, hybriden kan du jobba i kombination eller ladda ditt fordon som i det här fallet. För att få kontroll på ett system så handlar det om en total enhet. Och här är det viktigt att se hela kontrollen över hela anläggningen. Därför får en kostnadseffektiv men också en säkerhetsmässig kontroll på sin anläggning. Så gäller det att ha helheten i beaktning. Och det här är en av våra produkter som vi har utvecklat i Grätis verksamhet. Vilket vi gör mycket också tillsammans med andra partner och kunder. Toppen! Tackar! Där såg vi hur den här sparken ser ut i slutändan. Och det är alltså en, en eh, möjlighet att ersätta en vanlig motorvärmastolpe med eh, ett, eh, en elbilsladdare och motorvärmastolpe. Så det kräver ingen extra installation utöver det. Och kommunikationen från varje laddstolpe sker då över Lora till den här basstationen som vi visade tidigare. Och i bakändan så kan man ha sitt eget, eh, eller grepp i tillhandahåller, ett, ett infrastrukturkontroll då med lastbalansering och så vidare. Så, några funderingar eller frågor? I think we switch language a bit, so I switch back to English again. Um, if there uh, are any questions, uh, Per promised me to stay for a while. I don't know, Franz, do you have any questions? Yeah, because I suppose you... something. Uh, so I've used Arctic a fair bit, and I really like it. Um, is our, What's the sort of development state of it? Is it still under development, or is it getting sort of finished, or what's the next 
Are there, are there any cool plans for it in the future to expand it? Uh, you mean the, uh, the Arctic framework or? Yeah. Uh, well, the Arctic framework uh, is under constant development. Uh, so new features will be added. What we are uh, thinking of doing uh, is uh, in the next uh, iteration that we are working with now, uh, we will provide better uh, ergonomics. It will be even simpler to, to use and it will be more generic. Uh, right now, uh, you're bound to, to a single timer uh, for all the message passing because we also have postponed messages so you can schedule things in the future. Uh, with the next iteration, this will be totally generic. So you can have any number of, of timers backing your message passing and, and scheduling framework. Uh, I think that is the, the biggest new thing with Arctic 6, the, the upcoming version. Um, so uh, in the far future, uh, uh, I think we will look into um, something called async in Rust. If you're uh, aware of async in other languages, I think it's coming to Python and, and uh, other languages as well. That allows you to write a sort of, of um, lightweight uh, threaded code. Uh, so it is a cooperative scheduling approach where you're yielding uh, execution to other executing processes or tasks. Uh, and that could work pretty well with Arctic. And we have a prototype implementation showing that it actually works. But uh, we have to polish it a bit and see what, what um, is the actual usage patterns before it, we, we introduce it as an official feature of, of Arctic. Um, since the Rust language is quite new, it has been around for like five, six years. Uh, async came last year. Uh, it's a sort of um, under still some development uh, regarding uh, the actual compiler support for async. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, we need to use some unstable features of the Rust compiler in order to get it running on embedded. But we hope that within the next year or two, uh, this restriction will be lifted uh, because we believe that it's important that we are not relying on any experimental features of the Rust language and compiler in order to, to uh, uh, build sort of robust and, and uh, uh, sustainable applications. So that is a, a bit of, of what, what we're working on. Right. And finally, I can mention that we're also looking to uh, make the Arctic framework completely modular, meaning that uh, you should be able to write your own backend for upcoming architectures. If it's not a uh, supported architecture, uh, you should also be able to write other front ends. So language extensions uh, to the Arctic framework will be much uh, easier to make in the future once we get to the point where we have a modular framework. But it's quite some development needed in order to get that working. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I guess a follow-up question is um, how stable is the sort of syntax and stuff? Because I feel like I've changed Arctic syntax four times or three times while I've been using it from the, like with the macro and the app stuff. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, we are following uh, the, the Rust language development uh, in that uh, we were prior, in earlier days, uh, we were limited uh, to the syntax of using a const in order to, to capture the, the procedural macro. But now uh, we can do it on a module. So in Arctic 6, it will use the mod syntax. 
And uh, that will certainly be permanent because that is the way it should have been from the very beginning. Uh, I think that uh, the work of porting from Arctic 5 to Arctic 6 should be very um, straightforward. There is not a lot that has changed uh, to your code. Uh, I mean, you, you don't really need to alter much to get all the new fancy features. Right. Yeah, I don't think I had to change much in the previous translations either, so. Yeah, so I, I think we are approaching something uh, that is uh, likely going to, to be stable for a while. Uh, of course, when uh, the Rust language develops and, and we get new language features, we'll try to make the most out of them. And uh, if that implies changing, changing the programmer's API, uh, then we are willing to do so. And the good thing with Rust is that, that uh, a released version will always compile. Uh, because it has the pinned versions of, of uh, and compatibility guarantees of, uh, of the Rust language and cargo build system. So you don't really need to be worried about your program not compiling any longer due to updates. Uh, that's not due to us, it's a, it's a thing that you get from Rust. Yes. Great. I think uh, we will thank you uh, very much, Pa, for your presentation. And uh, you promised me to stay in the meeting. So I will, uh, we, we will end the meeting for now. But if there are any questions, please feel free to stay here and we can take them one on one with Pa. So, Pa and all the colleagues, very thank you for this presentation and the live demo. Uh, mm -hmm. It went very well and was really interesting to see. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you.